This is the third week of Advent. It's the week that we talk about joy. Our passage today is found in Psalm 126, and the sermon title is Finding Joy. I have a former student. She graduated a number of years ago, and she found a wonderful man, and they married, and they've been married for some years now. And about a month, month and a half ago, on Facebook, they announced that they had just adopted a baby boy. And I want to tell you, in that month and a half, on Facebook, I'm not exaggerating when I say over a hundred pictures have been posted of that little boy. And of course, he's as cute as can be. And every time you see a picture, every time you see a posting of that family doing this and that and the other with their new baby boy, you can just feel the joy popping out of the computer or out of my phone at me. It, it, it's just amazing the joy that's coming out of that. And think about it. I'm sure that they waited, that it was so, they've been through so much to get to the point where they were able to adopt that little boy. Um, I can only imagine what that would be. Uh, years of, of maybe trying to have a baby and years of disappointment and then years of waiting to see if they would be chosen to be adoptive parents. And then the day finally comes and now they have this baby and it's official. This baby is now a part of their family and they're gonna raise that baby. And the joy that has come out of that is just amazing. Finding joy. Can you remember a time when you experienced real intense joy? I'm sure that each of us have experienced joy in varying degrees many times in our lives, but there are those times that we experience that intense joy, that real joy. Maybe it comes at the birth or adoption of a baby, someone who's come into our family, that one that we've been waiting for and is now here and we are gonna raise that child. Or maybe it's the day that the person that you love tells you that they love you back. Or maybe it's finding something or someone that you've lost. I think about you know, with my kids and there were times where maybe one of them would wander off while we were at something and for the next five or 10 minutes, you're frantically looking for your child and finally some kind parent walks up to you and says, is this your child? Or you go to the police booth at the fair and your child is there and you feel joy because you thought your child was lost and all of the things that you could imagine in your mind that would go on that would happen to that child finally you're relieved and you're joyful that your child is safe and is back with you there are all sorts of things that we could think of that bring us joy remember a time in your life when you've experienced real and intense joy. As we look at this psalm, we see right away that the people are remembering a time that brought them incredible joy. They're remembering having come out of the exile and back once again into Jerusalem and they see Jerusalem, they see Zion, they see their city once again after being in exile for decades and decades. Maybe some of them have never even seen Jerusalem in person before. They've just heard their, their uh, ancestors telling the stories about Jerusalem. And they talk about, we remember when we came and we saw Zion once again. 
We remember the incredible joy that we experienced. We rejoiced and we were happy. And then the prayer goes on and it says, now restore us again that we can have joy again. And so they're remembering the days of the exile and coming out of the exile and the joy that they experienced when exile was over and they were back home again. Now they are an occupied people, a conquered people, and they're asking in this prayer, we remember that day, God, please restore us. Restore that joy again. The prayer of conquered people. And as we look at it, we see these two parts, the remembering and the asking. There's power in remembering. There's power in remembering what God has done. And, and in a way, power in reminding God what God has done. In this prayer, remembering what God has done in some way starts the process of empowering us and giving us hope that something can change because we can see in the past that it has that this is something that God has done in the past. It's powerful. And so we can see as we look at scripture and we look at history and we see what God has done, when we look in our own lives and our own life experience and we see what God has done, this is an incredibly powerful thing. And it lays the foundation then for the next part that we see in this Psalm and that is being able to ask God to restore our joy once again. And so we remember when we had joy. We remember what it felt like. We remember what God did to get us to that place. And now we say, God, this is our prayer. Give us that joy again. Help us to experience that joy. Move us out of the situation we're in so that we might have joy. Move us through that we might have joy. And so the next part is the part where they're asking for restoration. They're asking God to act. And we see different parts of it as they use different kinds of imagery. The first thing that we see is that part of asking is looking, looking for joy. They give this example of the streams and the beauty of the desert. Our first impression of the desert, many of us, is that it's dry and it's drab and, and, and all of that. We think of the desert as a difficult place. But as we begin to look around in the desert, we can see the beauty and we can see the life. And in particular, certain seasons in the desert, there's actually water that's available in the desert. And there's the beauty of the cactus and all of the other plants beginning to bloom. And there's color and there's life that is really obvious in the desert. But we have to look for it. We have to go at the right time. We know that in the desert, there are times where life is just blooming. We have to look for joy. And part of asking is looking for joy. And maybe it's looking for joy in just small ways. I think about just the other night when we were, several people were at the church for the hanging of the greens. And I saw some of the kids, actually they're more youth, that I haven't seen in a while. I've seen them in little boxes on the screen, but I haven't seen them physically in the same place. And I was amazed at how much they had grown and how much they had matured. I mean, even Seth has grown taller. And so you look and you find joy in just watching children grow and watching them accomplish things and do things 
And so we look around maybe for the small things, even in the midst of difficulties and trials and troubles, we look around and we see little places where we see joy. Streams in the desert, the blooming in the desert. We look around and we see joy. The next thing that we see that's part of asking for restoration, asking for joy, is waiting. It says we're sowing with tears. Waiting is almost always what precedes joy. There was a time many, many years ago, in fact, I was in college when I went on a spring break mission trip with my church. And it was an intergenerational trip. We had college students, we had uh, parents and grandparents and uh, younger youth. And my mother went on the trip and my younger sister went on the trip and my sister was in junior high. And there was this little crew of three junior high girls. And you can imagine on uh, a trip like that. Um, it was fun, but they're three junior high girls. There were times that they could be pretty annoying and, and all of that. But there was one night we went to Keems Canyon and we were there um, among people who were Navajo and Hopi. And we were right there uh, just off the Navajo reservation. And there was one night that we had a potluck dinner, and after the dinner, uh, a few of the Navajos wanted to ride home. And so there was a man, he wasn't the missionary from the, from, from the mission there in Keems Canyon, but he was somebody who, who worked there and volunteered, a um, middle-aged man, and his name was Earl. And Earl offered to drive these folks home out in the country. And the three junior high girls wanted to go along. Well, nobody really thought anything of it. And so they said, sure, they can go along. So they left right after dinner. And it should have maybe taken an hour by the time they drove wherever they were driving and they drove back. But an hour went by and then another hour and then another hour and then another hour. And by this time, we were frantic. We didn't know what to think. Now, this was a long time ago, and on the reservation, very few people had phones in their homes, and nobody had cell phones. And so we didn't know what to do. We didn't know if we should go out looking for them. Uh, we didn't know if we should just wait. Um, and we were frantic at that point. And all the things that we could imagine were going on in our heads as to what could have happened. And to these three girls, one of them my sister, these three girls were part of our church family, people we loved. We didn't know what. And so we waited and finally close to midnight, they came. And at first we experienced the joy of seeing them, the relief and, the, and all of that. And then we began to ask questions. What happened? What happened? Well, they drove this family home out in the country. And if you've ever been on the Navajo reservation, the homes are all very far apart, even miles apart. So they dropped this family off. And on their way back, for some reason, on probably one of these dirt roads or something, they got stuck in the mud and they couldn't get the truck out of the mud. And they tried and they tried and they couldn't. And it was dark. And so they began to walk and they walked and they walked and they walked and finally they got to a house. And they knocked on the door and the people invited them in and they explained their situation. And all the men in the family got in their trucks and they drove out to where the truck was stuck in the mud and the three junior high girls were left there in the house to wait. And as they sat there 
in this very simple house with really no rooms, just one big room and curtains, blankets that divided off different sections of the room. And there were these little children that were on the other side of the blanket and they would look behind the blanket and they would laugh and they would giggle. And these junior high girls who were scared and wondering when they would ever get home and when they would get back to the rest of us and all of that. And yet they found a certain amount of joy in the children that were looking behind the curtain and giggling and laughing at them. And they were impressed by these people that they didn't even know, but were hospitable enough to come in, invite them into their house, and to let them wait there uh, by a warm fire while the men went out and dug the truck out. Well, finally the truck came and the relief came to these three girls, seeing that the, they were gonna be able to go home and then they drove home. And then the joy and the relief when all of us saw each other again but what an incredible experience. And the thing that I heard from Earl, as he told about it, he talked about these three junior high girls and how they never complained. And in fact, as they were walking in the middle of nowhere, trying to find a house, that they were singing and trying to keep everybody cheered up. You hear stories like that and the relief of everybody being safe. But what an incredible experience of joy here and joy there and joy overall in the lost being found. Waiting, oftentimes waiting, worrying, agonizing, disappointment. It's all part of what precedes joy. Think about it. How many times you think about joy in your own life, in your own experience, it follows a time of waiting, maybe disappointment, maybe even suffering and pain, loss. And so waiting, waiting is part of that asking for restoration and joy, of joy. And finally, having hope is part of asking. Having hope, knowing that, as it uses the image of the, of the harvest, you plant in tears, but your arms are filled with the harvest in the end, and you have joy. Knowing that you have hope that joy will come. We don't always know when, we don't know how. And there are moments that we begin to doubt that it will happen. But ultimately, part of asking for that restoration of joy, when we come to God and we ask, there is that having hope that it's gonna happen. It reminds me of something I used to do in Indiana, and I hope to do here, but it's something that I loved in Indiana. This, this is a bulb. It's hard to believe that something like this is gonna turn out to be something beautiful. This one, has the potential of turning into a beautiful iris, which by the way, is one of my favorite flowers, irises. And so this is a bulb. And in Indiana, you plant this bulb sometime in the fall, like October or November, and you put it into the ground and maybe you know the dry stuff will stick out in the top uh, or whatever, but it goes into the ground and then you don't think about it because an iris isn't going to come out. Is it not? It'll start growing, but an iris isn't going to bloom probably until the end of April, the beginning of May in Indiana. But you put this into the ground and then you leave it there. 
And then amazing things happen because you don't know what's happening to it what's in the, when it's in the ground like that. Hopefully the roots start to, to grow new and fresh roots and they start to be nourished by the sea, by the soil, but you don't see that happening. And then it snows and you can get piles and piles and piles of snow on this. And then you really don't know what's happening to it, but you get snow on top of it. And then you get oh, all different kinds of weather, rain and mud and more snow. And then finally April gets here and you start to see the green flat leaves growing up out of the ground. And then as May approaches, you begin to see the beautiful stalks and these gorgeous, gorgeous irises growing. And the reality is that in Indiana, an iris needs the cold of the snow in order to grow in the spring. You plant it in the fall and you leave it there and you wait and you wonder. Maybe you even forget that you planted irises until the green starts coming up. And then you begin to see this, these beautiful, beautiful irises coming from this dead looking thing. You have hope though. In the fall, when you put this dead thing in the ground and then you let it go and you let it get into the dirt and you let it do what it's gonna do and you let the snow come and the cold and the frozen ground. And all of that is a part of what blooms at the end of April or the beginning of May, the joy. But when you plant this in the ground and then you wait, you have hope. You have hope that in the spring, the iris will bloom and be beautiful. That's a part of asking for restoration of joy. Finding joy. Finding joy starts with us remembering what God has done in the past. The joy that we have found in what God can do and has done. We remember the joy that we've had in the past. But then as we sit here and wonder where the joy is, as we struggle with the things that are going on around us, we ask, God, restore our joy. And in the asking, we look around and we see little, little hints of joy little pieces of joy, little moments of joy around us. And then we wait. We wait for God to act again. And we know that in that waiting, that waiting may be difficult. That waiting is hard. That waiting may be filled with worry. It may be filled with doubt. It may be filled with, with struggle disappointment. But we wait. Because almost always, waiting precedes joy. But while we wait, we have hope. In asking God to restore our joy, we have hope. Because God's done it before. And God will do it again. And so this Advent, maybe we're asking the question, where's the joy? Where is the joy? Let us remember. Let us remember the past. When God has brought us joy, let us remember what God has done, whether it's in scripture, in history, or in our own experience. 
And then let us ask God, God restore the joy to our lives. And in asking, we'll be looking for those little, little small pieces of joy around us. We'll be waiting, knowing that those, that waiting time may be filled with tears. And then finally, we will be hoping that time that we wait on God will be filled with hope because we know God can bring us joy. And so, where's the joy? We'll wait on God.